question is not stable today because no, it's it, perhaps it's in uh, that uh, our program so um, Thomas Kuhn and his theory of scientific revolutions Thomas Kuhn uh, he's an American historian of science he was born in Cincinnati Ohio in 1922 so he's uh, uh, and died in 1996 so he's a uh, like a contemporary of the 20th century and uh, well uh, approximately his year of birth coincides with the year of birth of my father so i can well i'm sort of uh, of the generations of the just younger generation but you are perhaps still younger than me, so perhaps he's your grandfather, we can say so. So it's not uh, just a very old man, and I've seen him personally when he arrived to that time Soviet Union. It was uh, uh, when Perestroika was on the run during Gorbachev, so we start to be more open, we invited a lot of uh, uh, scientists um, to, uh, to the Soviet Union, that then it was called Soviet Union. So I saw him in the year 1990 when he came to our, the Soviet Union and he gave a lecture in the Institute of Philosophy of uh, so um, Academy of Sciences of the Soviet Union. Now it's called Russian Academy of Sciences. So what is uh, special about Thomas Kuhn? Uh, he, uh, um, uh, when, when he finished school in uh, Ohio, he went to Harvard University where he studied theoretical physics. But then he started uh, to read a course, I don't know, maybe for students or, or for uh, just school children. It was this course of history of physics. Well, at first it was like a hobby, just doing this course and he continued his uh, theoretical physics, uh, uh, but um, little by little he got involved. He uh, was more and more interested in uh, this history of science. And uh, as he remembers, once he was uh, sort of striking by a question, what is the difference between uh, Aristotelian concept of motion and Newtonian concept of motion. Uh, was uh, Aristotle so stupid that he couldn't understand uh, how the bodies move? And then he suddenly had a, like a vision or insight that perhaps uh, this, this is not about the question of stupidity of Aristotle, but it's the question of incommensurability of these two concepts of Newtonian or Galilean concept of motion and uh, Aristotelian concept of motion. Well, uh, I can illustrate it by also, uh, and he illustrates it also by a certain, um, uh, well, uh, simile or uh, met metaphor. So, uh, the uh, According to Aristotle, there are six types of motion, and all of them are characterized and, and local motion, or what we call motion now, it's this change of space uh, in time, uh, change of coordinates of an, obje on a, of an obje object uh, with time. This was only one type of motion, according to Aristotle. The other types were, for example, growth. If you grow, um, physically grow, the plant grows, the animal grows, the ma a man grows, it's, this growth is also was regarded as motion. And in general, motion was uh, defined by Aristotle as coming from potency to act. So uh, something which exists only potentially becomes actual. And this is a um, general um, definition of motion according to Aristotle. Uh, also, uh, this motion 
not always takes uh, well just not always is a uh, continuous or just uh, happening in time it can be uh, instantaneous so it can happen in one instant for example when one form changes um, when uh, one one form is changed by another form well according to aristotle's sort of chemistry we can say so he didn't use this word uh, he called it uh, generation and corruption so um, one form takes place of another form and uh, so the previous form sort of disappears and uh, a new form appears and the matter uh, remains the same so matter just changes forms like for example a woman changes her dresses okay so um, well of course uh, to undress and uh, then to again put on your uh, say uh, dress it uh, or say trousers or blouse it takes time but in you can imagine that this process will just uh, be instantaneous so one form well like in Feyn Feynman diagrams you you if you remember uh, Feynman uh, wrote, um, just depicted these diagrams when say, say electron meets positron and uh, then out of this uh, collision comes uh, two gamma quants so this uh, uh, like change can be called instantaneous uh, according to Feynman we don't know uh, the exact time when it happens and what is uh, what are the intermediate sort of uh, um, intermediate stages of this reaction we know only that electrons and positrons meet and something is issued out of this collision so uh, say uh, gamma quants or uh, just uh, other particles we don't know but we 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 are also now speaking about this momentaneous change of forms this is aristotelian well for newton nothing of the kind happens newton and galileo concentrated only on physical or local uh, mo motion which is a change of uh, say coordinates with time and uh, they uh, the all other types of motion like growth it was sort of um, it was already a subject of biology and uh, mechanics didn't want to study it at all um, the change of forms was uh, pronounced alchemical so it was not uh, um, well, or maybe chemical at that time uh, because uh, mm, well this was this change of substances this what called later was called chemical reactions this was uh, not connected with motion at all so uh, aristotelian motion was somehow divided uh, in different branches of sciences and mix only um, just uh, uh, was interested in one of the types of motion not all of them so the the Aristotelian idea of motion was so sort of diluted and uh, then somehow lost because of course if we take motion in a most general sense um, this is not what uh, Newtonian and Galilean uh, formalism is do is dealing with um, well uh, of course we can also say that uh, or can also apply to local motion the same definition as with Aristotle we can say that now uh, uh, say a train is in Moscow but in potentiality it can be in St. Petersburg then after six hours or after four hours it is actually in St. Petersburg so what was only in potential in potentiality uh, now is actualized okay but nobody thinks with such categories so when thomas kuhn understood all this 
he understood that we don't understand really Aristotle, that we don't understand, uh, as he called it, Aristotelian paradigm. Paradigm is a, um, a, like a fundamental concept uh, which uh, pretends to explain uh, everything and gives us uh, so-called scientific picture of the world. Okay, so uh, Aristotle also pretended to give a scientific picture of the world. He uh, pretended to explain uh, chemical reactions or transformations of uh, elements. He um, pretended to explain local motion uh, by means of these ideas that different kinds of elements have different natural motions to the center of the world, from the center of the world and around the center of the world. Then um, he explained psychology um, and uh, even uh, biology, he explained uh, this uh, motion of animals and uh, other things. Uh, also, he has a treatise on meteorology. So, well, if you study Aristotle, you will have the picture of the whole world. So, um, in medieval universities, they studied Aristotle and they had a picture of the world. The, like we can say worldview. So, but this worldview was cardinally different from the worldview which was uh, given later, formulated by Rene Descartes, um, uh, Isaac Newton and Galileo. Uh, they gave another uh, picture of the world. It started with Copernicus. So the first uh, book which uh, Thomas Kuhn uh, have written, had written was the Copernican Revolution. Uh, this was published in, uh, um, in 1957 and uh, it uh, established his reputation of a histo able historian of science, mm, the Copernican Revolution. Why did he start with Copernicus? Uh, because Cop Copernic Copernican uh, idea was transitory. Um, uh, Copernican heliocentric world system did not change many things. For example, the sphere of fixed stars remained as it were. Uh, the world remained finite and uh, well, uh, Copernicus didn't speak about, uh, say, motion, or in, he didn't invent calculus, or didn't even had an idea of elliptical orbits of planets. So with him, the orbits were just spheres. So uh, it was imperfect, uh, but still it was the, how to say, the step in the right direction. And uh, from this imperfect model, there followed other more perfect models like Newton uh, explanation of elliptical orbits proposed by uh, Johann Kepler and uh, Galileo ideas of uh, uh, accelerated motions to which uh, Newton gave a formulation that uh, uh, they are these accelerated motions are produced by force which acts on a certain mass and now we had after Newton we had so-called new paradigm well Aristotelian paradigm was an old one Copernican revolution was imperfect science you know what it was an imperfect stage of a new paradigm then after this imperfect stage comes a perfect stage. Well, the same happened. You remember we spoke about scientific revolution of the 20th century. The same happened with Niels Bohr. Niels Bohr, when he produced his postulates, Bohr's postulates, you remember uh, Bohr's postulates about the motion of electrons in atom uh, that uh, Bohr's postulates. 
So they were like in, uh, it just was a second inside of, uh, mm, uh, of uh, Thomas Kuhn, that these Bohr's postulates uh, were the same imperfect science as the, Copern as the Copernican system. And uh, generally there, um, they call it planetary model of the atom was uh, also imperfect because uh, uh, planetary model of the atom couldn't uh, uh, explain the stability of the atom. So Bohr's postulates were an attempt to reach a solution. So why at atom is stable? So Bohr's, Bohr postulated that there are so-called stationary orbits. Well, he couldn't have explain just exactly why they are stationary and what happens and why uh, electron is not moving in a classical way. So, but it was the step also in the right direction. And then by uh, efforts of Heisenberg, Schrodinger, uh, Dirac, Feynman and others, there was postulated, there was a, a like, uh, prepared uh, like a mature a science or mature paradigm, new paradigm. So this paradigm is called quantum electrodynamics is what we are now learning at schools and at, in universities. So there well, it was codified in textbooks. So like Newtonian paradigm was codified in textbooks on classical mechanics, so the, the new paradigm quantum theory was also codified in new type of uh, books. So we have the, in this way, uh, two changes of paradigms. So the first change was from Aristotelian paradigm and from medieval university system of learning to the classical uh, paradigm and uh, the content of what was taught uh, in mechanics in uh, universities of the say 18th century and 19th century. Then there was again a sh paradigm shift, a change of paradigm, and now we are taught quantum electrodynamics and uh, uh, we have forgotten, well of course we uh, still know that uh, Newtonian mechanics exists, but um, we understand that for micro world, it is outdated. Well, this is what is called paradigm shift or change of paradigms. This is the first important uh, um, concept uh, of uh, Thomas Kuhn. It was formulated uh, shift, shift. It was formulated in his second book, the first book was the Copernican Revolution published in 1957. And the second book was the structure of scientific revolutions, uh, which is more popular. And I think you can, maybe you have even read it or just held it in your hands. Structure. Well, now we don't hold uh, books in our hands. We just Google them and upload them on our computer, say in PDF version, the structure of scientific revolution. This is very easy to do with the books of Thomas Kuhn because the uh, author's property has expired. So they are now in public domain, scientific revolutions. So again, revolution, Exi continues to exist in the title. Uh, so it is the, mm, uh, the main words, the key word for, but now it is not only the Copernican revolution, it's just scientific revolution in general. Well, uh, Thomas Kuhn also gives example from chemistry, how the phlogiston theory was abandoned, how Mendeley formulated his periodical law and so on. But here also we see that, say, Mendeleev table was also imperfect science because 
uh, Mendeleev did not explain why this periodicity takes place. And there were even some examples with argon and potassium uh, that uh, the potassium was uh, lighter, uh, his atomic weight, weight was lighter than the weight of argon. So uh, they should have changed their positions. But of course, uh, we see from uh, just the point of view of symmetry or emotionally we are involved and we understand that argon resembles helium, uh, krypton, neon and other in, in ideal gases, okay, or inert, inertial gases, yes. Uh, so inert, in, yes, in, inertial gases, which I don't know how they are called in exactly in, in English, no. Uh, but you understand me. And uh, uh, potassium, of course, belongs to the group of where you can find sodium, lithium, and others by his properties. So something, and uh, if, well, the new developments which were uh, started by Mosley and then by Wolfgang Pauli, they just explained um, that in reality it was not the mass uh, of the, atom the, the atomic weight, it was not the atomic weight which was responsible for the position of element in the Mendeleev table, but the charge of the nucleus. And uh, also there were some lanthanoids which were ex uh, exceptions and uh, uh, pr princ Pauli principle uh, explained uh, also these lanthanoids and also the uh, why after the uh, well why the properties are changed so uh, we we can now understand that what makes these uh, uh, elements akin like lithium and, uh, uh, sodium and potassium is that they have only one free electron on a new orbital. So these orbitals are like populated um, little by little and when all, um, well, this is called orbitals, yes. So we now understand better and uh, with Pauli principle, chemistry reached its stage of uh, mature science, okay, or a new paradigm. Now, Pauli principle is taught in schools and universities and everywhere. And Mendeleev table remained like the Copernican system remained. So, but we understand that Mendeleev, Copernicus, Niels Bohr were like pioneers in this new approach. So they were not, they were not creators of, uh, say, mm, uh, like, perfect um, concept. So there, this was, we can say, imperfect science. It was, a, it was a, like a breakthrough and a, we can say a um, brave hypothesis, but it lacked um, consistency and uh, it lacked some important uh, details and uh, it was uh, not free of contradictions even. So some new progress was needed and it was achieved. But we can say that with Mendeleev, with Copernicus, with uh, Niels Bohr, we achieve a breakthrough. So revolution starts from this uh, like radical, it sort of expands its influence and gains new uh, say territories and establishes itself fully and the enemies of the new ideas just die out. Okay, just, just die. So now nobody will question, say, uh, uh, Pauli principle or say uh, heliocentric uh, um, system or uh, Mendeleev's table so now, now all, all these uh, um, concepts are um, just basic 
for so-called scientific worldview, okay? Uh, but, well, uh, in, of course we can say, well, we, we know now, uh, or see how the, why the sun is bright and what happens, what nuclear reactions take place in the sun and how we can explain, for example, uh, the energy of the uh, sun. So what was a mystery to people in the 19th century is now clear for us. Uh, so, but why should we sort of um, try to move backwards and uh, uh, just uh, be interested in the history of science? And we can also ask why Thomas Kuhn didn't continue his study of theoretical physics and decided to return to uh, former epochs and uh, try to find some uh, like um, laws, uh, we can say the laws of scientific revolutions or the laws according to which uh, knowledge expands, sort of. Uh, why was it so important? Well, for Thomas Kuhn, it was just uh, an, an insight, um, which he maybe blindly followed. But Sorry, uh, so I, I've uh, I've told you that my internet connection is not stable. Uh, so, uh, Anshita, do we have new conference? Yes. Yes, we do have a conference. Anshita. Yes, uh, we do have conference. A new conference. Okay. So I hope this will go. Yes. Okay. I hope this will go. So we stopped at. Uh, say the importance of this uh, uh, um, how to say finding the laws of the development of human knowledge 
Why it is important? Because we are now at the threshold of a new paradigm. We have some unsolved questions and uh, say in biology, for example, there is a, a lot of questions which uh, we cannot understand. For example, we uh, decipher, we try to decipher the genome and uh, we cannot understand the role of certain uh, molecules which are part of our DNA and we cannot sort of understand what, why they are there, what are they, are they doing and what is the, as how to say, the impact of these sort of parts of our DNA in our life. Uh, so uh, we, we can start already uh, genome engineering, but without understanding what role do this or that part of our DNA play in our organism, we cannot proceed further. So we have to find a, like a cipher, well, not a cipher, but a code by which we can decipher our uh, genetic information. This is called, um, well, we, well, this is also a branch of science, which is, uh, I think, called uh, um, genetic information. It's just, uh, this is the how it is called. So we expect a breakthrough in biology. And according to, well, if we take this analogy of Thomas Kuhn, we can say that we have, all that we have now is still imperfect science. And of course, this invention of uh, uh, Mendel, discovery of genes of heredity, uh, his uh, um, uh, very much known experiments on peas uh, are like, can be compared with Copernican breakthrough. Then followed the discovery of the DNA. Uh, this is, was also a breakthrough. But what is still lacking is our complete understanding what is our genome. So what do we have there? So we cannot understand what role plays all the molecules in the DNA. We can understand that certain 